Welcome to the UCASO webinar on research on sexual assault in Utah, utilizing data to increase knowledge and improve practice. Uh, I am Julie Valentine. I am a assistant professor at Brigham Young University College of Nursing. I'm a forensic nurse. I also uh, have a practice with Wasatch Forensic Nurses. I have a research team. Uh, my team consists of Leslie Miles and Linda Maybe, also from Brigham Young University College of Nursing. Sage Williams is my lead research assistant. I also have other research assistants, Chelsea Falk and Michael Worthington. Uh, Suzanne Miles, Utah Bureau of Forensic Services of the State Crime Lab, is my contact on the collaborative portion of this study with the State Crime Lab. There are no conflict of interest to disclose. To begin, let's talk about where the data is coming from that I will present in this webinar. It is throughout the state of Utah. Currently, the data is from Salt Lake, which is Site A, Washington County, which is Site B, Site C, Iron County, and Site D, which is four counties, Box Elder, Weber, Davis, and Morgan County. It consists of four counties because one forensic nursing team, Northern Utah Sexual Assault Nurse Examiner, covers those four counties. When you look at those counties within Salt Lake, uh, they, it consists of or creates 65% of the population in Utah, 40% of the law enforcement agencies. Each one of those areas has at least one university, so there are campus sexual assaults contained in this data. Each one of these areas has established SANE programs and established SART programs, sexual assault response teams. This is very important because other research has shown that jurisdictions that have SANE programs and established SART teams have higher levels of prosecution and support for victims. The next data analysis that I will be completing, uh, the end of 2017, will also have data from Utah County, 636 cases from Utah County, but that is not contained in the information in this webinar. So briefly, let's talk about what happens when an individual reports a sexual assault. They may respond directly to a hospital, they may call law enforcement. They may also call Rape Recovery Center or Center for Women and Children in Crisis or Dove Center, another victim service area, and then are referred to go to the hospital. Rape is a healthcare issue. When they report at the hospital, a sexual assault nurse examiner is called. Uh, there also are clinics that a victim can be referred to if they report to a hospital first. Uh, some communities in Utah only have clinics and that's where the patients are seen, while others have a hospital or mobile response team. Sexual assault nurse examiners are specially educated nurses prepared to provide the best services and patient care to victims impacted by violence, specifically in this case, sexual violence. The goal of a forensic medical examination is really to place that patient on the pathway of healing. It is to evaluate for injuries and treat and recommend treatment with the collaborative partners. It is to provide resources and after those goals, the next uh, role of a sexual assault nurse examiner or sexual assault forensic examiner is to collect evidence for a sexual assault kit. Part of that collection includes documentation, and, which is photo and written documentation, and packaging of the evidence in a sexual assault kit, which is then turned over to law enforcement. So law enforcement are the gatekeepers of what happens to that sexual assault kit following evidence collection. 
The methodology for all of the data presented in these three studies that we will focus on for this webinar is the same. My research team and I travel across the state and we look at hard copies of sexual assault examination forms. The state of Utah has a standardized examination form. We then code that data into a statistical program program called SPSS, which allows us to analyze uh, a large amount of information. We code 208 variables for every chart. We can only code about four or five an hour, and we are close to coding over 4,000. So uh, this has been a project that we have invested thousands of hours into. This is what the SPSS data set looks like. To us, this is far more than a statistical program. To us, this is capturing these patients' voices. This is entering their data, aggregating this information to see what we can learn from all of these patients. In many ways, we, we feel that this hopefully sends a message that these patients matter, that the information about them and their assault makes a difference and hopefully will help all of our communities. So the first study I'm going to talk about is a descriptive study of 2,317 sexual assault victims, uh, really looking at what do we learn from these victims that can help us as we look towards prevention. That is, has to be a huge focus in any research on sexual violence. What can we do to take the information to help us prevent and decrease sexual violence? So the objectives of this portion are to describe the research demographics. This will include pre-existing physical and mental health illnesses, and then to talk about the implications of these findings as we look at expanding to evidence-based practices and community prevention strategies. When we talk about vulnerabilities and prevention, it's a very difficult balancing act. We can look at vulnerabilities of some patients that um, become victimized by sexual violence. And we have to be very careful that this does not lead into any victim blaming. Rather, in discussing these vulnerabilities, we want this discussion to help us understand what prevention programs might be effective? Who are segments of our population that we need to reach out to more? This is not meant in any way to buy into any victim blaming. So as I talked about, this is a retrospective chart review uh, from the four sites. Uh, all of these patients are 14 years or older. Uh, throughout the nation, adolescents are generally identified as 14 and older and have rights over their reproductive health care so they can receive a sexual assault examination with or without parental consent. All of these cases had a full exam with a fully collected sexual assault kit and they said that they wanted to report to law enforcement. So these are cases from January 1st, 2010 through December 2014. So let's look at age. You can very quickly and glancing at this slide see that the majority of our patients are young. In fact, 75% of the patients are 33 years or younger with an age median of 24 years. On gender, majority of our patients are female with only 5% male. Now there was a change to the state form in 2016. So we are beginning to get uh, some of this new data this summer as we've been coding this research and we'll have that um, to share with the community uh, 
towards the end of 2017. But that change was on sex, we asked male, female, transgender, male to female, transgender, female to male, and intersex. When we look at race uh, demographics, you'll see in one column I have study and the other is from the Utah census. Utah is uh, predominantly white. This is reflected in our study sample as well. The majority of our patients that we see are white. But note that black, uh, we have more than double, 2.5 times the number that we have seen as patients compared to the Utah census. We have a little bit less on Hispanic population and quite a bit less on Asian Pacific Islander. But American Indian, we have almost double the um, population throughout Utah. This is reflected throughout the United States. We know that American Indians, and specifically American Indian females, are probably our most vulnerable population when you look specifically at race. Looking at victim to suspect relationship, very similar to what we find across the board throughout the nation. Um, most victims know their suspect. In fact, we have only uh, about 19%, 18.6% that it is a stranger. Let me qualify that most of these strangers are not somebody jumping out in the bushes, although we do have those cases and we do have cases of strangers breaking into homes, etc. But many times this is, well, he was at the party. I didn't know his name. I didn't talk to him. I walked out to my car and he was there and uh, attacked me at that point. So they might have some very casual contact, but not know their name. To be coded as acquaintance, they had to have known their name and had some form of significant interaction with them so that they got to know the person, even if it was just that evening, but they got to know that person to some degree. When we look at interpersonal violence rapes, that includes spouse partner and also ex-boyfriend. So sp spouse partner is 7.3, ex-boyfriend is 5%. Now on our Utah State form, we do not ask about ex-boyfriend. Uh, the original form said stranger, acquaintance, spouse, partner, or other. But after we began coding in 2012, about 200 cases when we started, uh, we found that there were many times that other was checked, an ex-boyfriend. We have very few ex-husband or ex-spouse or ex-partner, um, but a significant amount of ex-boyfriend rapes. So our interpersonal violence, we're at 12.3%. Other, the 5.4%, that is generally somebody in authority or a family member, such as a boss, a teacher, a bus driver, an uncle, etc., Unknown, 5%. We do have cases where a patient is completely unconscious when the assault occurs, and they do not know who the suspect is or the relationship to the suspect. Location of assault, predominantly house apartment. Uh, next after that is that 15% of other. Most of those other are motel or hotel, and then 10% uh, outside, 7% car and then again 4% where patients do not know they were unconscious at the time of the assault. When we look at alcohol and drug use, about 17% of our cases are suspected drug facilitated assault. We do not have the toxicology numbers on that, but patients will say, you know, I had one or two beers and then I was out. I think that he gave me something or slipped me something. We have cases where patients have had water and have been um, drugged for an assault. Patient use of drug, 13%, alcohol, 46%. You'll see under suspects use of drugs and alcohol, we have a very high percentage of unknown, but we are asking the patient if the suspect used drugs of alcohol, and many times they don't know if they have um, or not. Uh, our numbers 
are a little bit lower than the national average on use of drugs or alcohol. And I think that's also reflected of, of many culture in um, Utah that may not be using drugs or alcohol. Let's look at the medical history. Uh, this is what the form looks like that the nurses ask. They ask, are you on any current medication and do you have any current medical problems? We do not specifically ask about uh, psychiatric problems or mental illness. This is what we found when we looked at patients and coded on what they listed as their current medical problem. We have 60% of our patients state they have a current medical problem. Now, what is really critically important on that is that means these are patients that are being seen by healthcare professionals. This really underscores the importance of healthcare professionals to be screening for interpersonal and sexual violence for those patients that they care for. Chronic medical problems almost half of our patients state that they have a chronic medical problem. Now from the Utah Health Department, uh, they l ran some numbers on Utah data for under age 40 years, and they found 18%. So remember, we're talking 75% of the patients in this study are 33 years and younger, yet almost half have a chronic medical problem. When you look at U.S. data across all ages, it's about half. When we break it into systems, there are two systems that we found higher rates of medical problems by systems, and those were neurological problems and respiratory. Uh, asthma was 80%, 85% of the respiratory disorders, but this was 11% in our study compared to 9% across the state, so not a significant difference there. Now on some of the data uh, within Salt Lake County, the forensic nursing teams ask the patient if they have had prior history of sexual assault. So we don't know this information on the 2,317, but we do on the 1,590 cases. And what we have found is that there is a high association with those that have had a prior history of sexual assault and medical problems, chronic health problems, self-disclosure of mental illness, and psychiatric medical use. This really confirms the ACE study or Adverse Childhood Experiences study in that past trauma that people go through absolutely affects their health, their physical health, and their mental health. When we look at patients that self-disclose mental illness, we found 36% self-disclose, 40% self-disclose use of psychotropic medications. Uh, the best way to capture this is we have coded for self-disclosure of mental illness or use of psychotropic meds. You have some patients when they're asked about current medical problems that might say, I have bipolar or depression, anxiety, uh, where you have other patients that may not self-disclose any form of mental illness, but they might be on several psychotropic medications. So when you look at that 45% of the patients in our study, self-disclose mental illness or use of psychotropic meds, and compare that to the prevalence of mental illness in our state, you will see uh, that our numbers are more than double. Within Utah, 22% of patients within a year state that they have mental illness or use of psychotropic meds. This really underscores the vulnerability of those patients with mental illness for sexual violence. And we're not just talking severe mental illness, but any form of mental illness. We then looked at the types and have coded for the types of mental illness. In red, you will note the ones that we have seen a higher increase in our study sample. 
Depression. We have three times the amount of depression in the patients that we see for a sexual exam than in the U.S. Anxiety. We have more than four times bipolar disorder. We have about three and a half times. And psychotic disorder, we have double the amounts. For those that self-disclose mental illness at the time of the exam, the highest percentage self-disclosed depression followed by anxiety, bipolar, uh, PTSD, and the list goes down from there. We also code specifically for what type of psychotropic medication we've seen patients are on. 40% of our patients are on psychotropic medications. That's compared to national numbers of 25% for female. Also another study with Medco Mountain West was 15%. Um, percent. Uh, these did not include bipolar medications, but really, again, underscores the high amount of patients that we see that are on psychotropic medications. When we categorize the type of psychotropic medications, atypical antipsychotics are used in generally in cases with more severe mental illness, um, but you will see we're 13 times uh, the national average, um, anti-anxiety medication, 20%, antidepressant, 35%, and significant higher amounts of bipolar medication. Now, in sharing these numbers, uh, there are cases where we might see a patient who really is in a severe psych psychotic state or psychiatric state and who does not disclose mental illness or use of psychotropic medication. So a retrospective chart review, we can only use the data that the patient share with us. So we feel that these numbers are likely lower than they actually are. When we look at other variables that we measure in these cases, we found for those that self-disclose mental illness or use of psychotropic meds, that there are higher rates of alcohol use prior to assault, that they have higher rates of suspected drug-facilitated assault, and that there are higher rates of these, of these patients that are asleep and awoke to being raped. So out of our study of the 2,317 cases, 14% of the patients were asleep and woke up to being raped. A sleeping person is a vulnerable person. A person with mental illness is a vulnerable person. A person that is drugged is a vulnerable person. A person that is impaired with alcohol use is a more vulnerable person. So what this really underscores is that sexual predators seek after and oftentimes cause increase vulnerability in those individuals that they target. So the implications of these findings, this just underscores that most victims know their assailants and this impacts how they, if they disclose that this happened to them, uh, we need to get this word out um, more so that th this is what we usually see. When we look at our most vulnerable groups, definitely the age 17 to 24 years are most vulnerable. 55% of our patients are in that block of age. Black Americans and Native Americans in our study are most vulnerable, and those with mental illness. And again, we have a high percentage of victims with current medical problems. This underscores the need for healthcare professionals to do screenings with the patients that they see for interpersonal and sexual violence. For research and clinical implications, we believe we need to develop more uh, nursing care practices and also collaborative health care practices, and then implement community prevention strategies for these vulnerable groups and educate primary care providers on screening. So I'm going to quickly jump to, I'm going to cover this fairly quickly, and this is a, one of the studies um, that's been very interesting on understanding paratraumatic symptoms of sexual assault. We believe a better understanding of this 
really transforms our care of victims across multitude of disciplines and professions. We're going to talk about the peritraumatic symptoms experienced by many sexual assault victims and then propose ideas for how uh, not just nurses, but uh, advocates, law enforcement, prosecutors, uh, across the spectrum, how we can use this research to transform our care of sexual assault victims. So let's talk about peritraumatic symptoms. If someone has grown up in a stable background, a stable, fairly stable home, we generally hold a world view that if we're nice to somebody, they'll be nice to us in return that overall the world is good and safe and we can learn to trust people. Well, rape and sexual assault shatter those beliefs. And that shattering can have a lifetime impact on our patients or victims. For those victims that we see that have had multiple trauma, have been re-victimized over and over again, that shattering just continues to occur. We love this quote by Wheeler, the brain and body are in constant reciprocal dynamic interaction, adapting to and influencing each other. We certainly see this in sexual assault. It is something that happens to the body, but absolutely affects the mind and emotions, mental and physical health. The neurobiology of sexual assault um, is somewhat complex and due to time, I'm really going to skim over this. But basically, what happens in sexual assault is the primitive brain of um, individuals is activated and that causes a release of hormones that flood the body, cortisol, catecholamines, opioids, and the body does this to try to preserve both the body and the mind, trying to protect. Uh, And as it does this, it blocks out the executive functioning of somebody's brain. This impacts their ability to remember things in a sequential order, to remember details that others might feel are important, but their brain will lock into details that are important for their survival. Many times uh, when I've interviewed patients for sexual assault exam, they will tell me something they heard that scared them, such as, I heard him lock the door. Uh, Memories get tied into senses. Their executive functioning, their ability to reason about what possibly I should do next, shuts down. Whereas the perpetrator of the violence is the exact opposite. They are functioning in their executive portion of their brain. So this also affects the ability of a body to move. We've all heard of fight or flight. Well, there's also fight, flight, or freeze. We frequently frequently see this freezing occur with sexual assault. Frequently it's called tonic immobility. It can last for seconds up to minutes to hours, depending on the flood of hormones that are released in an individual and every individual is going to be different in this. But this is when a patient will say, I couldn't believe this is happening to me. I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. I couldn't call out. They will also sometimes talk about dissociation. I felt like I was floating. Everything felt really fuzzy. Now, on our sexual assault examination form, the nurse or forensic examiner will write down a summary of the assault as described by the patient. In this, we found that many times they will describe some of these symptoms, such as uh, everything was really fuzzy. I 
I can't remember a certain portion or I felt like I couldn't move. The nurse also, or forensic examiner, asks, at any point did you lose consciousness or awareness? They can check yes or no, and if yes, they write a description as to what that loss of consciousness or awareness meant. So this study was a mixed method study. We looked at a qualitative portion where we analyzed all of the statements written down in 722 charts having to do with loss of consciousness or awareness, both in the summary of the assault and what the nurse or forensic examiner wrote down what the patient said if they lost consciousness or awareness. In doing this, we identified five themes. Patients either stated they had a full loss of consciousness or awareness, that they had memory loss, that they had changes in feelings of consciousness or awareness. We frequently will see written the term fuzzy. Things were not clear. They felt like they were somewhat checked out of what was happening to them. Many times this will be written after they talk about how afraid they were. We see tonic immobility where they are unable to move or unable to speak and dissociation. I was floating above my body. Um, I felt like it wasn't um, me. I went to another place in my mind. So we coded for those categories. What we found out of this 2,317 cases is that just about half of the patients reported yes to the question, did you lose consciousness or awareness during the assault? When we look at the categories, uh, 34% report a full loss of consciousness or awareness, 34% report memory loss, 16% change in feelings of consciousness or awareness, smaller percent tonic immobility, and dissociation. But remember, the nurses on the form are not asking specific questions about tonic immobility or dissociation. They are merely asking, at any point did you lose consciousness or awareness? We looked at what factors predict a loss of consciousness or awareness. And we developed a model that showed that there were three predictors for loss of consciousness or awareness. They were suspected drug facilitated assault, strangulation, and patient alcohol use prior to assault. We found that victims that reported suspected drug facilitated assault were nine times more likely to report loss of memory, consciousness, or awareness. Well, that makes sense. They believe that they were uh, drugged because they had full unconsciousness. We found that patients that reported drinking alcohol were four times more likely to report loss of memory, consciousness, or awareness. Uh, now, there are some patients that maybe only had a glass of wine or one beer, a small amount of alcohol, that reported loss of consciousness awareness. So we do not have numbers as to the amount of alcohol that was consumed. Victims that reported strangulation were almost two times more likely. That does not mean they were strangled to the point that they did pass out. It may have been that they their fear and the flood of hormones that were released impacted their feelings of consciousness and awareness. So can we predict loss of memory, consciousness, or awareness? Well, we found that this logistic regression mod model classified 75% of the cases in, in which victims reported a loss of consciousness or awareness. But the really critical point is that it failed to classify 25% of the cases meaning that we have patients that state loss of consciousness or awareness and did not report alcohol use, drug use, strangulation, or suspected drug facilitated assault. The loss of consciousness or awareness in 25% of these patients was due to the trauma from the assault. Now these are all patient statements that did not have any of the predictors, strangulation, alcohol, drug use, 
or suspected drug facilitated. These were all patients that were raped by someone they knew. You'll see memories that are there that are very fuzzy. I kind of went blank, just shocked, indicates that she was still aware but in shock during the assault. I didn't make eye contact. She described associations from her body. These are all things that the nurses wrote down in the examination. She says she doesn't remember exactly what happened. Things went blurry. I froze up. Everything is so blurry. I can't remember at all. That exam was just 15 hours after the assault. Again, these patients did not have alcohol, drug use, no suspected drug facilitated, and were not strangled. So what does this mean? Gives us understanding that the neurobiology of sexual assault trauma absolutely impacts these victims and their ability to recall what happened in in the assault. Uh, We believe we need continued collaboration with law enforcement and need to continue to educate that half of the patients likely will report loss of consciousness or awareness. This means that they will not be able to recall certain portions or any portions of their exams, certainly of their assault, certainly not in any linear fashion. This can make them seem like they are making things up or how could they forget this really horrible thing that happened to them. This truly is an expectation that that we see from the trauma that happened to them. We also believe we need to provide continued education to physical and mental health providers in caring for patients and the importance of having trauma-informed care and trauma-informed victim interview uh, practices. There are references for information on, on that study. I'm now going to quickly cover the last portion of this webinar um, or the third study that we're going to share all from this very large database that we're collecting. And this portion is a collaborative study between uh, the research team looking, coding the sexual assault examination forms and Utah Bureau of Forensic Services or our state crime lab. Now this is just phase one of this study. We are currently have entered into phase two. We were actually coding data on the DNA analysis findings of these cases. This portion is looking specifically on submission rates of sexual assault kits and the implications on practice. So the learning objective is to look at the submission rates and the predicting variables and then the community response in making improvements to create a safer and healthier community. So there's been a lot in the news nationally about the storehouses of sexual assault kits that have been found. Um, Over 11,000 in Memphis, 11,000 in Detroit, large amounts in uh, Houston, throughout Ohio. So we've really heard multiple news stories about this. This study is looking at that same issue from a different angle. It's actually looking at what are the submission rates. So we are tracking these kits from the time of evidence collection through submission. That's phase one. And then through submission through DNA analysis findings. And that's phase two, which we will do Uh, probably in 2018, we will have data on that. I think it's really critical to look at this actually as to what is this are the submission rates because finding kits in storage does not capture kits that may have been collected and possibly destroyed. The submission rates looking at it from that angle is able to capture um, a broader picture of the issue. So there's the purpose. I'll let you read through. So this sample is um, broken into two parts. The first portion of this research, I will give you data from 
January 1st, 2010 to December 31st, 2013, which is 1,874 sexual assault kits. And you can see um, the different sites, the numbers under those sites. Iron County is the most rural county in the study, also has the lowest amount of sexual assault kits collected. And then I, towards the end, I will give you recent findings on the addition of cases from 2014, which was an additional 443 cases to be a total number of 2,317 sexual assault kits. Now, the reason this study began in 2010 is the state crime lab uh, began to use improved methods of DNA analysis in March of 2009 and then had to validate those where they did improved STR DNA analysis and also began to do a test called Y-Filer. Y-Filer tests DNA on the Y chromosome and began to share with law enforcement and communities throughout the state of these improved DNA analysis methods. So our sample, again, is all fully collected sexual assault kits, age 14 and up. The crime occurred within the sites in the study, and the victim said that they wanted to talk to law enforcement about prosecuting a case. Now, as I stated, rape and sexual assault is a health care issue. We want these victims to be seen to address their health care needs. We want to be them and to place them in a position of control. They can receive health care and not opt to have a sexual assault kit collected. And health care includes medication to prevent pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections. Or they can decide to have evidence collected in the sexual assault kit and not talk to law enforcement, but think about what they want to do. We have up to five to seven days to collect that evidence. This helps them be of control of, of if they want to move forward on this case. Now those victims that said that I don't want to talk to law enforcement now, that information from those victims is not include, included in this study data. So we looked at variables um, legal characteristics and extra legal characteristics. When you look at criminal justice system research and outcomes, they usually divide variables into legal characteristics and extra legal characteristics. Legal characteristics are those variables that are defined by the state code. Extra legal characteristics are those variables that are reflective of the victim and suspect. Other studies have found regarding sentencing and other aspects of the criminal justice system that many times the extra legal characteristics might have a bigger impact on the outcomes. The legal characteristics that we looked at are those that have been looked at in other sexual assault studies. So if a weapon was used, if there was strangulation, multiple suspects, suspected drug facilitated, the number of assaultive acts, which goes from fondling up to four assaultive acts. An assaultive act is defined as uh, penetration of penis, digit, or object in vagina or anus or mouth or if a victim was forced to give oral sex to the perpetrator. And then that would be a total of four assaultive acts as the maximum amount. We looked at if ejaculation occurred, the number of physical injuries, and anogenital injuries. Now the extra legal variables capture the person. Uh, this study focuses on kits, but whenever I present this information, I always have to be very mindful to my audience that every kit represents a person, and it's not just one person. It's also the people in their circle, the people they love, the people that care about them. It has a wide uh, scope of affecting many people. So the extra legal characteristics characteristics we look at are age, gender, race, the suspect race, 
the time between assault and examination, the victim's use of psychotropic meds, mental illness, drug alcohol use, victims with physical or mental impairment, those are such things as cerebral palsy, deaf, blind, developmental delay. Uh, we have had patients that have been in uh, an intensive care unit following the assault due to their injuries and might be intubated and in unconscious on a ventilator. Uh, the victim report loss of consciousness or memory loss. Remember, that's about half of our victims. The victim to suspect relationship. If a victim had a consensual sex partner five days prior to assault, we always ask this because we need, we're looking for any DNA that is not the victim's DNA. And if the victim bathed or showered post post assault and before the examination. So what did we learn? Well, the legal characteristics, I'm not going to go through all of these, but you'll see strangulation, 12% of our victims report being strangled. Uh, ejaculation, I want to talk about, you'll see 30% of our victims said yes that there was ejaculation, but look at that high amount of unknown, 58%. And consensual sexual relations, most partners know if their victim, I mean, if, if their partner ejaculated. We believe that, that sharing this information um, is helpful in stating that this is an indication that it was a non-consensual sexual act if the victim does not know if the suspect ejaculated or not. Physical injuries, 74%. The most common are bruising and abrasion. The most common area is extremities. Number, number of physical injuries, a mean of six. Anogenital injuries, 60%. Most common anogenital injuries are abrasions and lacerations. Lacerations occur from blunt force trauma where the skin splits uh, for Women, the most common area of anal genital injuries is the uh, lower portion just outside the vaginal opening. For men, the most common area of injury is around the anal opening. Extra legal characteristics, I reviewed some of this in our earlier um, slide. Um, I do want to point out the time between assault and examination um, is generally about a day. Um, it's very few victims that are raped and then immediately report. Some do, but many are shocked that this happened to them. They don't know how to process this. They oftentimes will tell a friend or family member who says, hey, you should go in and get seen, but they just take some time to process. Uh, additional extra legal characteristics, you'll see 8% of the victims had a physical or mental impairment that 28% uh, stated there was a consensual partner, so we need to get a DNA sample from that partner before the uh, or to help with the analysis, to take that partner out of the analysis mix, the DNA analysis mix. And 35%, so fairly large portion of patients bathe or shower post-assault. Now we found with recent research with the improved DNA analysis testing methods that it does not matter if a victim has bathed or showered regarding being able to develop a full DNA profile. So we coded all of the data on these cases and then developed a list for the crime lab to look up to see if the sexual assault kits were turned into crime lab. When we gathered this information back to crime lab, we found that the cases were submitted really within three categories. There were some kits that were submitted within a month of the assault, some submitted one to 12 months of the assault, and some were submitted a year or later. We have uh, discussed these as being the forced submissions. Most of these were in late 2014 through 2015 when there really was a media push and public outcry for kits and storage to be submitted. So we would see that a law enforcement agency would submit 30, 50 kits all in one day, cleaning out their shelves of these old kits. 
So this is a very busy slide. What I'd like you to do is look on that second row where it says submitted within one month of the assault and just follow that across. You'll see that site A submitted 16%, site B 0.8%, site C 14.6%, site D 4.9%. As you look at each one of these rows and look across, you will note huge variability between the sites. Go down to the total submitted, you'll see site A about 41%, site B 18, site C 39, site D 36 for an overall submission rate of 38%. Now when you look back up to um, looking at site B and site C, where it says submitted one to 12 months after the assault, we went from 3.3% to 22.9%. Now those are neighboring counties in southern Utah, yet a significant difference in the submission rates between those counties. So we found uh, overall again 38.2% for those sexual assault kits submitted within a year of the assault, again, site B and site C, you see a huge difference. We found that the number one predictor if a sexual assault kit was submitted was the location or jurisdiction where the rape occurred. So if a victim had a sexual assault collected in site C compared to site B, they were more than nine times more likely to have their sexual assault kits submitted if they were in Site C. So we did a logistic regression model using uh, a statistical technique that allows us to, to uh, factor out that site or jurisdiction was the number one predictor. And we looked at other factors that made kits more or less likely to be submitted. And what we found that there were two factors that made kits more likely to be submitted. If it was a suspected drug facilitated assault, 25% more likely to be submitted. If it was a male victim, those kits were 46% more likely to be submitted. So that actually was the second predictor behind CIDR location. Now Loretta Lynch, um, when she was Attorney General, uh, really pushed a program on identifying and preventing gender bias in response to sexual assault and domestic violence. Now, when we look at less likely to be submitted, we found that if victims use drugs prior to assault, that frequently, in other research as well, has shown to make them less credible, 22% less likely. If they had bathed or showered post-assault, 17% less likely. Uh, that's really an, an education that um, for law enforcement that we can get DNA. It doesn't matter if they've bathed or showered. We still can get DNA in those cases. Victims with physical or mental impairment, 17% likely to be submitted. Victims with physical and mental impairment across other studies as well have been shown to often be less credible and to have less response from criminal justice system. And, and this, um, we had the same finding. If it was a known suspect, they were 16% less likely to be submitted. Remember the bulk of our cases, they are a known suspect, but we found that even cases where it was a stranger, only 55% of sexual assault kits collected from a stranger rape had been submitted to Crime Lab for analysis. Now let's talk about the money aspect of collecting kits, but then not submitting them for analysis. Out of those uh, kits that were not, what were collected but not submitted, 1,163, there was a total cost of $721,000. Now this came out of the Utah Office um, of Victims of Crime and that money could be spent for therapy or other options. So I will go back to again saying that the goal of a forensic examination is, the first goal is not evidence collection. Rather, it is helping that patient and addressing their health care needs. But a large portion of our time 
and a large portion of the expense is on the evidence collection, which was then not submitted for analysis. So how does Utah compare? Well, you remember it was 38% overall, and these were 2010 to 2013 cases. Uh, most areas of the country don't know this number, their submission rate. There actually are not very many studies on this. This is beginning to change, but this is an area that needs to be tracked more. But most areas were about 60%. We were 38%. So in this original study, which was um, released in 2016, we stated this was justice denied for victims that had sexual assault kits submitted, uh, had collected, but then not submitted. Justice and equity as the strongest predictor if the kits were submitted was the site or jurisdiction. And the extra legal characteristics exposed biases affecting sexual assault kit submission. So we recommended, and this was in 2016, that there's a standardized submission by state law mandating automatic submission of sexual assault kits and testing to the state crime lab, the establishment of the sexual assault kit tracking system, and that these things will reduce the prevalence of sexual assault in Utah by improving criminal justice system response. Uh, I'm going to skip to the next one here. Well, the great news is that these recommendations came to pass. In uh, 2017, House Bill 200, sponsored by Representative Angela Romero, who's been a great advocate uh, in this area, uh, mandated the submission and testing of all sexual assault kits. It also mandated the development of a tracking system, which is in process right now. Now we do have information regarding the 2014 cases and it's very good information. Now this was before House Bill uh, 200 was passed and you will see, I'll jump down to the bottom, that 2014 we compared across the state 38% of kits being submitted to 75%, just about doubled the amount of kits. Uh, hats off to law enforcement for being incredibly responsive and beginning to turn in the majority of the sexual assault kits. Now you will again see that there is significant variability between sites. That still remains the number one predictor if a kit is submitted or not. So we did a prediction model for all of the kits 2010 and 2014. We found that suspected drug facilitated assault still, still showed up as making kits more likely to be submitted. If the victim bathed or showered post assault, they were less likely to be submitted. And still, if it was a known suspect, they were less likely to be submitted. We found that the CIDR jurisdiction remains the strongest predictor of sexual assault kit submission, that the only predictor that increases sexual assault kit rates is if it's a suspected drug facilitated assault, they're 20% more likely to be submitted. We did find one addition on factors that decrease sexual assault kit submission. Uh, bathed or showered was still there, and if the victim knew the suspect, but with this additional uh, caseload for 2,317 cases. We found that if the victims self-disclose mental illness or use of psychotropic meds, that those victims, their sexual assault kits were 8% less likely to be submitted. Now here is great news with this slide. This shows the prog progression year by year of sexual assault kits and the submission rate. You can see in 2010, which is when we began this study, we were at a 29% submission rate. This last year of 2014, we're at, we were at a 75% submission rate. This received some national attention. This is an online uh, source, Vocative, that had a fabulous headline um, hallmarking what Utah has done and really this is reflective on law enforcement what they have done that this state just took a huge step towards solving more rapes submitting more kits. Now when we talk about kit analysis 
This is uh, for victims, but more importantly, it is for justice. Um, In phase two that I'm in the process of doing where we're looking at the DNA analysis findings, I found out of 525 sexual assault kits that the DNA analysis actually excluded, in nine cases, excluded the suspect, meaning that we could have had nine cases if we did not have those DNA findings where we could have suspects charged for crimes that they did not commit. So utilizing DNA benefits justice. It gives us information about the case. It is science that we can utilize to improve our safety of our state. And here are references on that final portion. And we would look forward. uh, This is a growing database and there are additional research studies And we look forward to continuing to share these things with Utah. Thank you.